Hi, everybody. Welcome to a little place in paradise down at the southernmost portion of mainland United States, Key West, Florida. Every year, the sailors come here for Key West Race Week. Hi, everybody. I'm Peter Eisler, and that's why we're here. For the next hour, you're going to meet the sailors and see the boats that came down to race in the biggest regatta in the northern hemisphere in the wintertime months. Everybody's here in the sailing sport, from Russell Coots, the America's Cup champion from New Zealand, all the way to the mom and pop teams who shoveled the snow off their little boats, hitched up the trailer, and drove down the Florida Keys to Key West. They all came for one thing, great competition. Well, maybe another thing, too. Great sailing conditions. The water's warm and onshore, lots of fun. Stick around, you'll have fun, too. This is the 10th anniversary of Yachting's Key West Race Week, and it's truly a unique event. There's over 2,000 sailors here racing 263 different boats. They come from 32 different states, a record number of 35 international entries from 16 different countries. Now, the sailors come here for the great weather. They come for the warm water, the superb nightlife and entertainment. But best of all, they come for the great sailing.
Getting your boat and crew down to Key West Race Week requires a lot of planning and time. I remember the first time I came here racing, we were sailing dinghies. We stacked about three of our boats on a trailer, drove all the way down, and camped out once we got here. My, oh my, how things have changed. Today's professional crews fly in, some on private jets. But for the majority of the sailors here, they still do it the old-fashioned way. Hitching the boat up to the trailer, making a long drive down the Florida Keys to Key West. Drove the boat down from Michigan. Uh, we left uh, the first weekend in December from Michigan to go to Atlanta. We had uh, arranged to store it at an RV storage spot. And uh, we left at 8 o'clock in the morning on a Saturday morning, and it was almost 9 o'clock at night on that night, and we're driving through Knoxville, Tennessee, and going, well, just as soon as we get through Knoxville, southbound on I-75, we'll find some place to call the quits for the night. I kind of look in the rearview mirror, and I see my, my tire from the boat trailer about six inches outside of where it's supposed to be, and I could see that because it was nicely backlit by a big glow of orange where the, uh, the tire had come off the axle and the springs were dragging along I-75 and completely lost a uh, tire right off the boat trailer. Just outside of San Diego, we hit snow. We went over the first bridge and it got a little slippery, went over the second bridge and did a six-wheel slide. A mile marker, 652, <laughs> on Interstate 10, eastbound. You go, just as you go over the bridge, look down the side of the road, about 50 feet down is, like the aliens had landed, it's the ball from Amelgus. Just the ball, nothing else, just the ball. Okay, so what do you do if your boat is too big to hitch it up to the trailer and drive it down from New York or drive it across country from California? That's the problem the South African team that sailed Seagoon faced. The original plan was to transport their boat aboard a container ship, but the boat missed the boat. Well, it's a brand new boat, and they didn't quite have it ready in time to make the ship, so they had to had to sail it here, or it wasn't going to get here at all. We had the steering cables break once, which uh, put us into a little 360, but uh, nothing major. Uh, we seemed to cope very well. All the guys on board seemed to cope with each other fairly well. We got on each other's nerves a little bit after 35 days, but um, that's not to be unexpected when you go downstairs and see the whole inside of the boat's black. Windows are closed 90% of the time because you're getting water over the deck. But um, we had a good trip. It was uh, 27 days to Barbados, which is our first port of call, and another seven now. You, know, you don't take a boat like this across an ocean normally, so we wouldn't have done it um, unless we really wanted to be here. Every morning at around 7.30 or 8, the sailors return to their ships. Of course, armed with copious quantities of coffee to help ward off the effects of the evening activities, but the task at hand is the same as at every regard, to prepare the boat for racing. The 
sails have to be put on the boom and on the foredeck. Spinnakers stopped and stuffed. Lines are rigged. Any sort of last minute fine tuning or repairs are made to the mast or to the hull. And of course, if you don't think your bottom is smooth enough, you can always hire one of the local divers who are happy to accommodate and tell you that your bottom is slipperier than anyone else's. They want their bottom checked every day. It might be clean, but you know, they can pick up a pot line or you know, have something wrapped around the keel. Tell me, when you get down under there, do you really clean or you just hang out for a while? No, I sit down there and blow bubbles. So, see what's on the bottom, Rolex, is that sort of thing. And then once everything on the boat is just perfect and all the crew are aboard, it's time to leave the dock and head out to the race course because the committee is going to blow that starting gun at 10 a.m. sharp. Over 263 boats. This is the biggest wintertime regatta in the Northern Hemisphere. So many boats, do they all race together? No. They're divided up into 19 different classes. In fact, they race on three separate race courses. The biggest classes are the one design classes. These are boats that are totally identical. A good example is the Melgus 24. They're the biggest class here, 48 boats. The mass size, the sail size, the hull, all are strictly measured to make sure that no sailor has an edge, except in their skill. And one skilled sailor here is the defending champion, Dave Ullman, a sailmaker from Newport Beach, California. Competition is superb. We have less boats this year. We have uh, 12 less boats than last year, but the, the caliber is much, much, much better. We have uh, uh, two or th we have three past world star champions in the class. Just a number of very, very good people. It's just an exciting boat to sail. It's the best thing that's happened to the sport. In, uh, in a lot of years, it's, uh, it's a full planing dinghy that older people can sail because it has a keel trainer wheel. It's just really exciting. sail at Melgus 24 and, and you'd never sailed before, it wouldn't be where you'd start, but you certainly would be what you'd aspire to for maybe over 30 years old. It's not a, it's not a thingy for young you know, kids, but certainly for somebody my age, it's about as exciting sailing as you can, as you can get. It's just, just really good. It really goes fast. Another popular one design class is the Bruce Farr Design Home 30, which attracted more than 30 entries. You know, this boat has been a real success story. Introduced just a year ago, it's become a popular racer, especially up and down the east coast of the U.S. Sailors are attracted by the boat's modern design, high performance, and great competition. The sail plan makes the boat very easy to sail, just a small, non-overlapping jib, big mainsail, and a huge spinnaker for good downwind speed. A unique feature of the MUM 30 is that the owner must drive. This rule is implemented to try to prevent the arms race and keep the pros off the helm. A 
Other one design classes in Key West include the very popular J27 and J80 classes, racing over on the Division II race course. Over on the Grand Prix race track, there are three one design classes. The MUM 36s are back. These boats are very popular international racers and will be featured as a small boat division in this year's Admirals Cup. The one design 48 fleet was back. They made their debut here in Key West last year and attract a number of top international competitors. And then, the new Corel 45, another Bruce Farr design, has its first fleet together in Key West. Racing for the very first time, an incredible international field which includes five boats from overseas and one American boat. The fleet here in Key West indicates what's happening in the sport of sailing. Even at the bigger Grand Prix end, the sailors are going towards one design, level racing for more fun on the water. In all, there are seven one design classes in Key West. The other 12 classes are boats of all different sizes, which are grouped together in classes based upon their speed potential. Then, a handicap system of time allowances allows these different disparate boats to compete against each other. On the mostly amateur Division II course, the arbitrary performance or PHRF handicap system is employed. But over on the Grand Prix Division I course, where the America's Cup sailors and professionals are racing, these high-end boats are equated by the much more complex IMS handicap rule. Now, if you watch the America's Cup on TV, you know that design is important in sailboat racing. But believe it or not, two boats of the exact same design can be very different in speed on the water, depending on who built them. That's because builders use different materials, different techniques of construction. And Key West provides a great opportunity for builders to see how their boats stack up in real racing condition. Anybody can make little breakthroughs, but the key is to have a boat that performs in all conditions well, and all points of sale well. And also there are some trends that happen. Uh, boats have become lighter and faster than they used to be. They used to be designed and built to compete with rating wheels. And now boats are being designed and built to sail more efficiently. And so everybody's looking for what makes sailboats go fast. And that's what I've been specializing in for the last 20 years. So what is that little thing that makes a boat go faster? We changed the heel and rudder on this boat just before we came down here. Minor little changes. But the boat has a much steadier groove now. And just sails more easily all the time. It makes an average helmsman look really good as a result of winning our class. A cranky boat, a boat that's hard to sail, can make good sailors uh, look at the inept. And a really good boat can take a fairly average sailor and put them in the front of the class. So we're always looking for the boat that makes it easier for the sailor to do what he knows how to do. Sails, they're the engines that drive a boat. And if you're a racing sailor, there's nothing more important than having a fast sail shape and trimming it to perfection. If your sail is slow, throw it away, get a new one. Over the years, sails have really changed. Now they're made out of high-tech materials, fancy construction. And Key West affords a great opportunity for sailmakers to display and test out their latest designs. We wanted to do some sail development, and it was cheaper to make cross-cut Dacron mains than Mylar mains, so we uh, built a number of models, a number of shape models in Dacron, went and tested them, found what we thought the best model was, tried to duplicate it in a Mylar radial sail, couldn't do it. Um, when we duplicated the shape, no problem, but went out and tested and we could not make the radial mylar sails go as fast to go through the range as well as the Dacron sails, so we just stuck with the Dacron sails. And Obviously, looking around most of the racing boats, you see a lot of the new 3DL sails. They're really not so new anymore, um, but we continue to improve them, and I think that the technology there is ever-moving. No matter how you construct the sail or what you make it out of, it's still, a, still really important that the designs are fast, and if you don't know how to replicate good designs, get to them in the first place, it doesn't matter what you make them out of. So obviously the sail designers are the guys that we really uh, think are the important people. All this high tech about carbon, all the technical stuff to save weight, reduce stretch, it comes down to this, duct tape, little scraps that you just tape together to get out on the track. Because without duct tape, it's not safe to leave the dock. You can leave a lot of things, you know, spare sheets, halyards, but with duct tape, Never enough. 
sailing aboard his hot-looking New Zealand-designed and built Thompson 26, is sailmaker Chris Bouzade, a Kiwi by birth, who now lives in Rhode Island. Wairiri, just it's a uh, Polynesian or Maori, because I'm originally from New Zealand, and it just means uh, flying fish or flying over the water or skipping over the waves or all of the above. Best thing about Key West? Well, you always get wind. It's a good place to come because you know you're going to get good races. There's always some wind here. This year it hasn't, so far it hasn't blown quite as hard as usual, but you always get good breezes, good racing, big fleets, and the race committees that they get together for this event are better than, way better than what is normally used in most events. I think the level of competition has improved every year? No, I don't think so. I think it's about the same. I mean, I think sailors are sailors. They don't change. The boats change. Not many people can claim an Olympic gold medal and the America's Cup to their record, but the wizard of Zenda, Wisconsin, Buddy Melgus, can. A sailmaker and boat builder by trade, his shop has produced the popular Melgus 24. We had a chance to catch up with him one evening. Buddy, great to see you. Thank you, Peter. Fun to be here. Huh? What brings you to Key West? Well, all these boats are down here, you know. We have to see what the Melgus 24 fleet's doing, and, and uh, we got some Melgus 30s down here. And why not get out of Zenda? The snow is uh, too deep on the ice to run an ice boat through, so uh, Gloria and I decided we better come down and coach. Peter, is that uh, maybe our sailing game is getting too much like the Washington Monument and not enough like one of those Egyptian pyramids. And we need to do a better job with our young people in, in getting them educated to what sailing can be because it's a sport that you can take through life. The only thing you have to do is sail something the length of your age. <laughs> <laughs> Star World Championships, Olympic gold medal, America's Cup champion. I mean, Buddy Mogus is everybody's hero, including mine. What's up on your calendar for sailing in the future? Well, I, I, you know, I've gone through a little bit of a setback in the physical this, this fall, and I'm looking forward to dig out of that and get into a, a, a real active uh, physical program. Being with Bill Koch uh, in the 92 Cup, he, he sort of brought that to me. And so now I, I, I'm going back out. I, my kid is winning too much at home, and, and I think he needs to be punished. So I, I feel I'm the perfect one to do that. All right. Well, great. <laughs> On the race course, Mike. <laughs> great to see you. Thank you, Peter. Maybe the hottest boat here, or at least certainly the one most talked about, belongs to Canadian John Risley. It's numbers. Skipper by sailing superstar Russell Coots, Numbers is a Jim Taylor designed 47 footer, brand new. It will be representing New Zealand in the upcoming Admirals Cup series to be raced in England this summer. Aboard is a multinational crew, including a number of sailors that we last saw aboard Black Magic when they took the America's Cup away in San Diego. Yachting's Key West Race Week has attracted boats from 16 different countries, and the crews come from literally around the world. 
They come because this is one of the biggest events in international sailing. There are sailors here from Canada, England, Europe, Scandinavia, the United States, South America, Africa, Asia, New Zealand, and Australia. Can you think of anybody that's traveled any farther than you to get here? Ooh, Perth is halfway around the world from here, so... No, I don't think there's anyone else coming from Perth to come here, but uh, there's probably a few from Sydney and uh, New Zealand, and that's just about as far, almost. How long did it take you to get here? 20, oh, good connections, 27 hours. We're all from the UK. Most of the other guys are um, just local South African guys. Yeah, all, all the crews of the, this boat are of Europeans. I'm from the Virgin Islands. Uh, we're sailing with 10. Uh, we've got five locals on the boat, and we've got five people from New Zealand. Some of our old German crews here. Six people from the United States. Two people from uh, came from uh, New Zealand. Two people came from uh, uh, Tokyo. And we've got Australians and New Zealand and uh, French, uh, predominantly English. Um, in the main, the uh, people that have sailed with me and my indulgences over many years. If you look at the weather map, it's minus 40 in Sweden, it's plus 30 here. So, about 70 different regions. We absolutely totally mixed crew. We've got a South Africa, we've got Irish, we've got Scottish, we've got English, we've got German. Got American. What do you do if you have a boat but you need a crew? Well, you can call them on the phone, send them a plane ticket. There's even a website called Crew List where you can find the very best sailors. But what if you have some bad luck and lose your crew? Or just put it off to the last minute? That was the dilemma one Canadian sailor faced. That was until he went to the local pub. We have an international crew here. I Ireland? England? United States, Canada, and United States, she's got. And Portugal. And Portugal. Oh, and Portugal. And oh, at the bar. Oh, at the bar. At the bar. Remember that green parrot? <laughs> <laughs> the That's green where we parrot. got the crew list. It's the crew depot. <laughs> yeah, a very good rum and coke there. Mixing crews from around the globe on your boat can cause some pretty interesting communication problems. But luckily, the universal language of sailing usually comes through. The whole front of our book is run in Greek, and uh, the back is in English. And in fact, we decided today that the front of the boat dictates to us what's going to happen. They tell us what kind of set they're going to do, but we have no clue who understands Greek. So um, we just got to look and say, what side the pole on? Oh, I guess we're doing a jive set. So they actually run the boat from the front of the boat. It's quite good. Racing with Harold Cutmore next door, or racing with uh, Urban Laidlaw next door, or racing here with the Kiwis, who are some of the Australians, and with the Seppos, all of us Americans mixed up in there. I mean, it is hilarious. Because we're all trying to say the same thing, but we use a different dialogue. I think they have a secret code that they don't use. They don't want to let it out. I think they pulled your microphones in the cockpit in the America's Cup. No one's ever going to find out until the next time. I'm not really sure what he's referring to. He might have uh, some sort of card gun with some of his mates around here, but I don't know. Really. <laughs> uh, well, they speak English, but I think they have this little sign language. It's something beyond normal language. You know, he's avoiding it right now. You can see there's resistance. Weather helm, leeway, boom vangs, and bowsprits. Have you ever listened to a couple of sailors talking? Sometimes it sounds like they're speaking a completely different language. Hey, maybe they are. Fortunately, here on the show, we have America's Cup bowman, Dean Phipps from New Zealand, who periodically will take us on a tour around his Grand Prix 46-footer numbers. That is, if you can understand him. Okay, hi, I'm, I'm Dean Phipps from uh, New Zealand, and uh, I'm the bowman on numbers 97. And uh, come on board, and I'll show you around the 40. This is my kind of domain, and uh, right here we have a spinning pole, carbon fiber, very light, and... Today's technology, they're getting lighter, and you can see the size of it, that's why it's so light. Fire hatch, used for dropping the chute at the bottom row. Uh, as you see, it's very small and uh, not very watertight. Work the back further. Main sheet runs below the deck and back to the main sheet winch. And uh, we have trouble with the main sheet trimmer on this boat. He has, keeps losing an end of it and uh, we end up with too much on one side and not enough on the other, so it's a trouble. The back of here is Spaghetti Factory. That's uh, turned into Horace at the pit. 
And uh, as you see, you come to a bottom mark and you've got head like this, no good because the sheep won't come down. And that's uh, not what we're looking for today. mention Key West and most people immediately think of tropical breezes and warm turquoise water lapping beautiful white sand beaches. Indeed, the last island of the Florida Keys is a haven for water sports enthusiasts of all kinds, whether it's pleasure boating, fishing, scuba diving, or just baking in the sun. However, Key West has another side, and that spirit and color is perhaps best reflected on its main thoroughfare, busy Duval Street where cars share the road with almost an equal number of assorted bicycles and motor scooters. However, Duval Street is probably best explored on foot. Shops, markets, museums, taverns and restaurants beckon pedestrians. sometimes feel that you're on the edge of the world, and in many ways, you are. In Key West, when the day ends, the fun is just beginning. Sunset on Mallory Square brings together jugglers, clowns, musicians, acrobats, and dozens of vendors in a daily celebration, with the huge orange sun as the guest of honor. After a great day of sailing, the town of Key West provides racers with an opportunity to relax and unwind and enjoy some refreshments, just as sailors coming off their ships have done for centuries. We have to do the mandatory rum party from 6 to 8. After that, yeah, you hit the town and get all, go to all the local spots. We have some of our favorite meeting spots, like the Hog's Breath or whatever, and all the crews meet out. It's been a lot of fun. Well, the Hog's Breath, that's, uh, we've been spending a uh, little time there. We get to go. I guess Rum Runners. Key West would have to be, it seems like it's the hog, you know, it seems like the hog's breath seems to be the place after the beer tent, it seems to be, you know, well, I guess it depends where you live, you know, so you can do your lap and, you know, you know, going, it's like on the race course, you know, you don't want to be going back on yourself, you know. They don't let me out much. I guess Sloppy Joe's is where we always end up. They usually have the best bands. Every night, we take us to the race show, <laughs> so that makes me happy. Key West is a, is a really hysterical little place. <laughs> well, I, to be honest, like, we haven't seen too much of it. And uh, I know the boys were a little dusty one morning, a couple mornings ago, but uh, we try to keep that as much as yeah. as possible. It's a very tricky question. My favorite, Ben and Jerry's. <laughs> <laughs> and we got a party tonight. Uh, I would say to him, uh, come to Key West because uh, there's a lot of sun, a lot of girls, a lot of beers. A few laughs, a few yells. <laughs> Every so often, I light up. I don't know anybody who's ever had a bad time in Key West, and I know a lot of people have come down here on vacation and just stayed. It's the most fantastic place in the world. And uh, one of the top general trimmers in the world has hold of this, and it's Simon Gordon, and uh, he does a great job. It's controlled by two grinders. And they uh, are the muscle men on this boat. They pull the shit in for Simon and and control the what comes on and when and how. One of the great things about the sport of sailing is that women can compete equally against men. That fact was highlighted, of course, by the America Cubed All Women's Team in the 1995 America's Cup. And there are a lot of those team members here in Key West. 
And up until this year, I've been the only one with Renee Meal and once in a while Don Riley on these docks, let alone um, on any of the boats. So it's been very refreshing to now see a whole new um, level of women coming down and participating on the big boat level. Uh, women have been very active. In fact, in collegiate sailing, uh, the ratio of men to women is 50-50 now. So in the dinghy arena, uh, women's sailing has escalated tremendously. But it really took America Cube and what Bill Koch did for putting women on the water at the America's Cup level to really break the barrier into the big boat scene here. I think women's sailing has definitely taken off. Um, if you look around Key West, almost every boat has a woman on it. And there are a number of uh, veterans from our America's Cup team on different race boats racing down here. So, you know, I think that's one of the lasting legacies of Bill Koch funding a women's America's Cup team is that it gave us all the experience so that we do deserve to be out here racing equally at this level. I think women's sailing will continue to grow, especially with great events like this. The recent America Cubed all-female America's Cup team highlighted the fact that women can compete equally against men in the sport of sailing. Well, Paul Anderson, the owner of the J-29 titillation in Division II, decided to take it one step further. As his crew, he has all women from his home club in Deltaville, Virginia. Skipper is the owner. His name's Paul. And um, he likes to sail with an all-women crew, and he takes a lot of flack, but I think they're all really just jealous. All the girls were lamenting how they, they were sailing with guys, not allowed to do anything on the boat except sit there. And they, as a joke, said, you know, we ought to just put all the girls on one boat. And they looked at me, and they said, well, you don't have any crew, so we'll take your boat. Every girl from the yacht club is, is on that boat. <laughs> and the other skippers were not too happy to be losing all their female crew. But the fact was that on other boats, we weren't in the positions that we're in now. I mean, we, we, had, to work, yeah, we, we had, had to work so hard. We had to work so hard to get into a good position, whereas when we got our titillation, we all just sort of, you know, found our niche, figured out where we were going to fit in best with the crew, and, um, and it's worked out, and everybody's got a job, nobody's just railed me. During its first decade, Yachting's Key West Race Week has grown in importance to attract a wide field of sailors, the very best in the world. In fact, there are teams here preparing for other events, like the Whitbread Round the World Race and the Admiral's Cup a biannual event held in southern England that includes the famous Fastnet race. And, of course, the America's Cup that will next take place in Auckland, New Zealand in the year 2000. Well, being a defender, it's going to be uh, it's very, very tough. And you, you've got to look at the history books, and, and really the only country that successfully defended it is uh, you guys. One of the uh, advantages we've got, if you like, we're going to try and play to our strengths, is that uh, we have two reasonably competitive boats from last time, and, and uh, if we can get some good full-size data, then, uh, then hopefully that will combine with our research program and, and uh, give us, a, you know, uh, hopefully a, um, some sort of jump at the start in uh, technology, but we're fully aware that all the other teams will be putting in a lot of effort. It's, we're coming along, we're going to New Zealand to sail in March, and we're excited about that. We're going to do the Congressional Cup, and we're just starting to ramp up the sailing program. Um, and then, then the next thing is the design program, and we're off. I'm not sure why I'm doing it. Uh, I think it's just the, the final step uh, with the America's Cup. I mean, being the first, or the, one, the only girl on an all male team, then with the all women's team. Now, if we mix and match it and put the best people on the boat for the job. That's making the final statement. Uh, we're doing a challenge out of the Virgin Islands. It is fantastic. Okay? It's the best thing since bread, or since ice cream for the islands, man. Um, it's what they needed. So for us, different than any other syndicate, we've got other reasons for doing it. Uh, I personally have both. I'm going to win the sucker because it's a great challenge. But I'm also going to revive our islands. Our islands need something like this to focus on. And we've had two hurricanes that hurt us. We had crime. We had a little problems. This America's Cup just came in at the right time. A few of us got together today. There's a great idea. Let's try it. And it's going great. Every day we gain momentum. And, you know, one mountain at a time. And so far we've hopped over the first three. We've got about 60 more to go. But uh, we're very encouraged. Things are going well. This is all part of our preparations for the Admiral's Cup. Uh, we are part of the Admiral, British Admiral's Cup team. We always like to get back, of course, at the end of May for the, one of our great races in Britain, which is the Round the Island race, Round the Island White. And having won that a few times, we want to take our new boat and see if we can do it again.
helmsman. It's a bit big for Russell Kurtz, but he struggles, you know, he finds it just fine. It's, uh, it's light, and uh, he's reasonably comfortable back here. You, want, you don't want Russell Kurtz on the bow. And then back there, you're starting to run out of boat, and uh, that's about it. International team competition for the Key West Trophy was a new feature of race week this year. It was popular with 10 three-boat teams competing. In the end, the USA Blue Team beat out the team from down under. The winning team was the Corel 45 Rush, Chris Larson aboard Jameson, and Buddy's son Harry Melgus steering the Melgus 24 Wicked Feet. There were 76 boats divided into eight classes on the Division I Grand Prix race course. In the One Design 48 class, J.J. Eisler steered Windquest to a victory over John Coleus on Abracadabra. Russell Coots and his New Zealand, American, Canadian team on John Risley's numbers won IMS Division I. Rod Davis won the Corel 45 class, steering Adelanti, George Andriotis' boat from Athens, Greece. They narrowly beat out Tom Stark's rush, who finished second. In Class D, Equation nearly swept the fleet with seven victories in eight races. Esmeralda, the 40-footer from Japan steered by Kenny Reed, made it look easy in IMS Division II. Chris Larson kept his winning streak alive, steering Jameson to first place in the MUM 36 class. Bob Dockery's Henderson 30 Zoom won the battle with the Melgus 30s in Class G. Keith Rodney's Sheerness, a Taylor 41 from Boston, Massachusetts, won PHRF Division III. We saw some great racing on the Division II race course. 112 boats divided into nine classes. In the end, Chris Fouzade's Y. Ray Ray had an almost perfect record, finishing second just once. That same record was shared by Andrew Wilson's CNC 40 Electra. Well, the titillation crew proved their worth on the race course, winning four out of the nine races and taking first place ahead of Hustler at another J29. He won only one race, but thanks to all top ten finishes, Dave Ullman successfully defended the hotly contested Melgus 24 class, edging out Vince Brun of San Diego by nine points. Talk about domination. Michael Law's team aboard Intruder in the MUM 30 class cleaned the fleet out, winning five of the eight races, a margin of 40 points on the final scoreboard. Finally, on Friday evening, as thousands of sailors enjoyed cheering the awards being doled out to the 19 winners of their respective classes, the drama built as to who would be named Boat of the Week. The coveted yachting trophy goes to the boat, winning their class with the closest, most competitive racing, as determined by an elaborate formula. And to make her week even more special, all begun with a last-minute invitation to steer one of the hottest boats of Key West. My favorite sailor, JJ, was called up to accept Boat of the Week honors on behalf of owner Doug DeVos and the crew of Windquest. The booty included an Omega Seamaster Professional Chrono Diver Watch, and the prestigious yachting trophy. No matter where you finish in the fleet, it's impossible to have a bad time if you're sailing in Key West. But now, let's take a look at some of the winners in action. Key West Race Week is in the history books. We saw some great racing and some pretty ideal sailing conditions and met some of the top people's names in our sport. And if you've never sailed before, 
Maybe you got a little taste of the fun that you can have out on the water. Hey, you can aspire to sail right here someday. Hope you enjoyed today's show. Until next time, I'm Peter Eisler saying so long from Key West.